in stereo, uh, this is uh, your first film, I understand, um, yeah. and uh, was watching it. I, when I read the, the description, it had been uh, kind of described as a romantic comedy, but when I was watching it, I noticed a seemed very cynical, um, a lot of cynicism in it. Do you kind of feel like that what you were trying to capture was cynicism that you see in general in people, or was that just kind of a stage that people go through and then you know, later on they learn more about relationships and things change. Um, kind of give me your take on that. Well, I think it's both. I think, I think, um, I think there's, a, there's a telling statement, that, a telling sentence that the, the David character gives in the shrink's office where he says, what, are you, what happens when you go through some, a phase where you want something new? And some people are mature enough to handle that and go through it, and others are not. And, and I think that even those who are mature enough can also go through phases of just, like, throwing caution to the wind and right. choosing to make bad choices. And, 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 and maybe not bad, you know, bad sounds like you're judging, but I've, I've said it myself to, to, to people about this film, is that these guys are making bad choices. But I don't know that it's necessarily bad. I'm learning about myself or more about these characters, even as I talk to them in this press tour that I'm on, where, you know, you know, people just do things and they try to find ways to fit into the world in, in ways that they uh, can live with or feel like they're stagnant, they want to grow out of. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by human behavior. I mean, Robert Altman said he could care less about plot. Right. He likes, he wants to study human behavior. He likes human behavior. And that's what, that's kind of what I wanted to do with a movie like this. And, and, and in addition to just explore the, the awkwardness and the weirdness of, of, of trying to navigate the 30s, I guess, of your life, where mm -hmm. you're kind of setting up the rest of your life, and, and you're still wanting to hold on to your 20s, and you're making these really kind of questionable choices, but you're also, you know, not quite ready to, you're not quite ready to give it up. You still want to hang out with, with the youngsters, and you still want right. to be free. You're also just trying to figure out what kind of artist or what kind of what kind of person you want to be in the world. And in this case, they are kind of creative types, which mirrors my existence here. That that combination of trying to figure out who you are as an artist and trying to relate to people can be kind of tricky. You know, you, you're dealing with crippling self doubt, mm -hmm. uh, you know, self loathing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, you question a lot of that stuff. So I don't know that it's cynical. I understand that it can, can come off as cynical, but I, it's more of just holding up a mirror to what I've noticed uh, in, in a people of all ages. I mean, Woody Allen's films, who, uh, Woody Allen's a hero of mine. And, right. You know, his, these characters of his are in their 50s and 60s and they're making choices like this. Like they're, That's they're correct, childish yeah. and, 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 and whatnot. And, 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 you know, I think it's, it's, an, it's, it's not a symptom of... of maturity as much as it is maybe complacency at times in your life where you just maybe want to mix it up or change something up. You just, you just go through stages. And the shrink says it too, you know, you go, you just, you, people go through stages. And this is, this is a film about sort of witnessing kind of people in the middle of some of those stages where they are kind of acting poorly. And maybe at some point they get it together and they can have, you know, fruitful relationships, whatnot, but this happens to be exploring a time <laughs> where they're not quite, right. not quite there yet. Not know? quite at that point. So this story, um, I know this is something that you've thought about for quite some time. You, you did the short uh, early in your career. Um, how did the story evolve from, your, from writing the script to directing it um, and, and through the editing phase? I know you did all of those things together and sometimes things right. kind of change during those different phases of filming. Uh, so how did it evolve? How did it change? Well, I read it a while ago, yeah. Um, I had it as a script. I was living in Austin, Texas at the time. Oh, that's um, a great town. Yeah, you know, it was a great, great town. Great, very creative. Very, uh, it was very singular in the formation of what I, what I, what I value in, in film and music and whatnot. So, you know, I was trying to make a movie. I was trying to make films. And I just, you know, you have to work with something that you can actually accomplish and get made. So I wrote, a, you know, I started to write characters. I, I, a, a woman, a friend of mine wanted me to write her a, a monologue for acting class, and I, I wrote, you know, she was very acerbic, very witty, and very funny, but also kind of, you know, can kind of be bitchy occasionally. Right, right. And, and I wrote that monologue. It's not actually at all the same, but it's that, that monologue where, where Brenda's doing her podcast, and she's sort of ripping on the world and mm -hmm. on social media. Of course, so elements like that changed because social media was barely around when I wrote the first draft of the script. So it was more of a personal sort of um, esoteric, much 
more stream of conscious type of rant about what's going on in her life, and right. it was really funny, and he loved it. And that created a character of Brenda, and I said, okay, well, this is a character. So when I started writing the script, I had no idea for a film. I just had a character. And then I just wanted to, you know, make something that I could shoot, and I had, you know, watching a lot of Woody Allen films, Mike Nichols films, and, and they're about people and behavior, and Altman films, and Paul Thomas Anderson, and all these great filmmakers that were doing interesting things. And I wanted to do something interesting, not just make a movie for the sake of making a movie. I think a lot of filmmakers make that mistake, where they just want to make something, and they write something that's by the numbers. And, and so this was no idea, really, for a story. I started writing characters, and I joined up the David character, sort of a blend of my own experiences with a bunch of guys that I know, going through some weird stuff, and um, came up with that. And then there was a relationship that I knew about where someone was cheating on someone else that I knew, and that mm -hmm. sort of infiltrated its way in the this, in this film. And it became a, a thing, and then... Uh, Music is a huge part of my life. I'm my right. trumpet player. I played, I played trumpet in Austin, the music scene, for years before I came out to L.A. And, you know, the stereo element came a thing where I, I felt like, you know, we could do something visually with this element of stereo with the left and right and with the perception of where you are and what you're seeing and how what that means to you depending on where you're standing, you know, and things right. look a certain way but don't really mean what they, what they, what they represent visually or, or whatever. And, and so I just settled on the, the script and the title in stereo, and it allowed me to feel like I could do a cool movie that's sort of shot with symmetrical shots, left and right, sort of zero point perspective, and making something that looks visually cool. But it also made me have to focus on the composition of the film as opposed to making sort of a handheld film where everyone's just sort of talking on screen. I wanted to compose a movie that was done in a way that's that sort of like that, done in a way. Where, really a, a real filmmaker at work or filmmakers at work we're doing something that's not just getting something committed to, to film or to tape we're actually composing a piece of work here with music right and, uh, something with the something definitely with some layers as opposed to uh, just something that uh, feels right on the surface and it doesn't go in anything beyond that um, uh, you know, definitely could see that. I tell you, you were talking about the music. The one of the things I absolutely loved about uh, in stereo was the soundtrack. Um, uh, the music that, that accompanied the action just to me was absolutely spot on. A few years ago, I did a music video for Menahan Street Band, who are artists on the Daptone Records label. Um, they're basically, the, if you're familiar with Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings, um, Menahan Street Band is basically the Dap Kings without Sharon Jones, with okay. a few different personnel changes. Uh, there, but we did a music video together, and I became friendly with the guys. And, and uh, when it came time to do the movie, I, they're a very New York sound, and I also didn't want to date the film with music of any particular time. And that sound is timeless, you know, that right. soul sound. It doesn't Absolutely. matter where you are, that sound fits anywhere in any movie. It obviously does give it a feel of a throwback, but that doesn't matter. I mean, it's, you can't place it in any particular time because artists right now are doing that kind of music. And it's popular today, as is, well, as is popular as it was in the 60s. And you know, artists like Leon Bridges are out right now that are doing beautiful stuff. And it's, 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 it's happening now. And I just thought, this is, this is music I love. It's got a great sound. These guys re record to tape. They don't do digital recording. They still record to, to, to old school tape. Mm -hmm. like they did in the Motown days. And they, they make albums and vinyl. And it just gave me a feeling of peace being around <laughs> these kinds of artists and music. And... And you know, it lended a feel to the to the to the to the film, a pulse to the film. And I asked them for it, and then you know, they were kind enough to let me use some of it. And then I talked to U Ubiquity Records, who also does great, uh, has great artists, and sort of pitted them against each other. And I was like, hey, I got Dap Town. Ubiquity's like, all right, well, what, what deal are they giving you? We'll give you some music too. <laughs> and so you know, um, I got some music from two labels. They really, they really came to the came to bat uh, and gave us uh, some access to some. At a, at a break that we're able to, to work out. Wow, and, and I tell you, it really does give the film a, an energy uh, that right. carries it along quite well. You know, you're shooting in your in New York. You've got a tight, you know, tight budget, tight time frame. I know, but you know, one of the things I noticed, and, and it, it's pretty uh, apparent on screen, and in talking to some of the actors. Um, in, in interviews before, they seem to have a really good chemistry. Uh, was that something yeah. that you noticed throughout the shoot? Because Yeah, I did. Uh, we got lucky there. I mean, look, you, you don't have the luxury of doing what are called chemistry reads right. uh, on small films like this. You know, at studio movies and TV shows, they end up doing chemistry reads when they want to settle on a couple of actors to see how they feel and look on screen. But 
I got I, I hired Bo Garrett out of LA when we met with her after she read the script and she wanted to do this. We had a great meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, she wanted to do it, and then we moved the production to out to New York. I hope we didn't lose her. And she said, "No, that's a great idea. Let's do it." So then we went to New York and we found actors to read for the part of David who just weren't quite getting it right. And then uh, Micah's manager sent us over a tape and also a short film that I thought just really nailed it. I could you could do the comedy, the uh -huh. end, drama, all of it, and he really just had a rhythm to his speech that was in line with the image that I had for the role, which is a guy who was angst-ridden, but still kind of had some humor to, to him and lightness about him. And uh, I offered him, we had a meeting, and I, we talked about the movie. We, were, we could tell we were both making the same film, and he really wanted to be a part of it, and I offered it to him after our meeting. So then, uh, from, from then on, we just cast people who were who just gave the best the best, perform, the best audition or the best meeting, and I think we just got lucky. But yeah, people seem to comment really on the chemistry between uh, uh, Micah and Bo on this. So that's something that just, you know, that's kind of magic. You can't really plan for that. And Absolutely. They really just got lucky because they really internalized the lines and really made them natural for themselves. And they just, they fell into a nice rhythm. Yeah, and they are, they are absolutely magical on screen. Uh, what do you think the biggest challenge was uh, in your shoot there in New York? You know, i got to tell you, it was not that... They get probably, uh, shooting in LA is harder than shooting in, in uh, New York. Some the permits give you a lot more room. So I, if you're asking what the hardest thing was, I think was the logistics of managing the sound. Really, right. it's boring, but but it's really just that stuff that you know you, you, you don't own the streets. You have people yelling and screaming and walking by, and cars driving and all that stuff. Right, right. We just had to be diligent and stick to it until we got takes that were clean, and we just you know. We, we were able to do a pretty decent job. The sound has some problems here and there, but it's a small movie, and we have to live with those. But um, I think that for the most part, it comes off okay. But it was probably just managing the logistics of New York City. Well, it's, it's New York. I think people would expect a little background noise. Yeah. <laughs> I would imagine. Um, so how does it feel? You're two days away from uh, opening your first film. Yeah, I mean, it's a weird feeling. I, I'm exhausted. But I'm like riding a wave of, I was telling somebody earlier, I feel like it's a wave of adrenaline and caffeine and like anticipation. It's the first film and it's coming out. It's just, uh, it's crazy. And so far the work is pretty nice. Uh, we had a great premiere and a good festival screening and uh, got some interest going in my next project. So all the things that you expect are, are kind of are kind of happening. So um, I, it's really great. I, I don't know what I'm going to feel like on Friday, but... I have a Q and A on Friday at the LA screening, and so I'll find out what the well, <laughs> reviews uh, are coming out this week. So it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's an assault on the senses, man. Hope you're awake for it on Friday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's all I have for you, Mel. I know you're very busy, and I really appreciate your time today. No, it's my pleasure, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. You have a great day, and uh, good luck with your film, and uh, look okay. forward to seeing what's coming up next.